directors meeting. This is the press conference given by the governor of the Bank of Russia, Elvir Nabi Ulina, and the deputy governor, Alexei Zabotkin. And to start with, the governor's statement following the board of directors meeting. Good afternoon. Today, we have made the decision to raise the key rate to 16% per annum. Inflation and inflation expectations remain high. The key difference between the current economic situation and our October forecast is the expansion of output. New data suggest that the economic growth has deviated from a balanced path more significantly compared to our earlier estimates. This deviation is a factor intensifying persistent price pressure. To alleviate this pressure, we need not only a high key rate, but also its elevated level for an extended period. I would now dwell on the rationale for our today's decision. Firstly, as regards inflation, current price growth remains fast. The persistence of price pressure is evident from the dynamics of core inflation. Its growth rate has been above 10% in annualized terms for four consecutive months. The impact of the earlier ruble depreciation on current inflation is becoming increasingly weaker. The decline in the ruble exchange rate that had occurred in summer was translating into prices quite fast. Overall, the past three facts almost completed now, taking into account the ruble strengthening in autumn. These are prices for the components of the consumer basket weakly influenced by the exchange rate that are rising most quickly today. Thus, over the past three months, the growth of prices for services, excluding housing and utility services, exceeded 14% in annualized terms. The accelerated rise in prices for services is considered as an indicator of persistent inflationary pressure in the economy because these prices tend to respond to the exchange rate and vary as one of factors less significantly. The dynamics of prices for services in the first half of the year partially followed the earlier surge in other prices, whereas now this is high demand that is the main factor pushing service prices higher. Strong demand is supported by high inflation expectations among businesses and households. In November, people's inflation expectations rose even more. Companies' price expectations have been staying at their peak for several months already. Considering the actual price movements this year, Inflation will reach a level close to the upper bound of our forecast, that is 7.5%. Next year, inflation will be slowing down. Among other factors due to our early monetary policy decisions, taking into account the current level of price pressure, we might need a longer period of higher interest rates to achieve the inflation target next year. Secondly, the economy. GDP growth in the third quarter was notably faster than expected. Recent data evidence that the trend continued in the fourth quarter as well. The economy is expanding so rapidly because it is using almost all the resources available. In October, unemployment dropped to 2.9 percent, which is a new record low. According to our regional monitoring, the intensity of labor utilization has been growing. Increasingly more manufacturers are extending the working day and adding work shifts. The actual capabilities of the economy determining its potential depend on labor resources along with available technologies and production capacities. A stubborn high inflation is the evidence that the economy has deviated from this potential and lacks capacities to meet soaring demand. If we had ignored high inflation and had not been tightening monetary policy, this would only have produced a negative impact on the economy. Imagine the economy as a vehicle. If you try to drive faster than allowed by the specifications, the engine will overheat sooner or later, and we will not be able to travel a long distance. Possibly we will be driving fast, but for a short period. When the economy is overheated, that is, it lacks sufficient production and labor resources, the manufacture of each new item would involve increasingly more difficulties and continuously rising costs. The attempt to support the growth of the economy at a level exceeding its potential through accommodative monetary policy would entail price growth that would be absorbing household savings and rising wages more and more. Ultimately, we would be unable to ensure an actual rise in people's welfare. This 
is exactly what we are seeking to avoid by bringing inflation back to the target and returning the economy to a balanced growth path. Thirdly, as regards monetary conditions. The banking sector continues to adjust to the key rate increase. The inflow of funds in the deposit market has been expanding, driven by high interest rates. The credit market's response is uneven. There are first signs of a slower expansion in corporate lending, but its growth rate is still at a record high, especially in the segment of short-term loans. Some companies have been raising such loans to finance their current operations, expecting budget payments that are normally made at the end of the year for the most part. Companies' demand for loans is supported by high price expectations, as well as expectations of strong domestic demand. This is confirmed by business surveys in Russian regions. More details about economic activity, price expectations and lending in the federal districts are available in our regional economy report. Retail lending, especially the mortgage segment, continues to surge. Although the expansion of market-based mortgage lending has slowed down, the extensive subsidized programs have been notably weakening the transmission of our decisions. The proportion of subsidized mortgages is still growing. In November, such loans accounted for 80% of all mortgages issued. In recent months, the increase in unsecured consumer lending has been decelerating compared to its record highs. Next year, monetary conditions will be tightening because of not only the key rate, but also a number of other factors, including the cancellation of the easing related to banks' liquidity covering ratios and the already implemented macroprudential measures. All this can reduce banks' risk appetite. Now, I would like to speak of external conditions. Regional trends in the world economy remain diverse. Overall, economic growth tends to decelerate. The downward trend in the global economy causes an adjustment in the demand for commodities, including oil. This is a major factor of the contraction of Russian exports over the past two months, although with a certain time lag, this might entail a reduction in foreign trade earnings. Nevertheless, the OPEC Plus agreement on oil production cuts will support oil prices in the future. Besides, imports have been shrinking as well, although less considerably compared to exports. The monetary policy tightening has been not only affecting import dynamics, but also contributing to the stabilization of the ruble. I will now speak of possible risks. pro professional risks still prevail. The main one of them is high inflation expectations that might weaken the response of demand to our decisions. Geopolitical risks and risks of a slowdown in the world economy still remain and might adversely impact the demand for commodities and, accordingly, the dynamics of the ruble exchange rate. Another pro-inflationary risk is a possible expansion of the subsidized lending programs if the government does not make them limited and targeted. In this case, the effect of the key rate on the economy will notably weaken and, consequently, we might need to keep the rate higher for longer. Winding up, I would like to comment on monetary policy prospects. The Bank of Russia will set the key rate at a level, helping to bring inflation back to the target by the end of next year. Until we are confident that there is a steady downward trend in price growth and inflation expectations, the key rate will stay high for as long as necessary. Thank you for your attention. Dear colleagues, now we start the Q&A. Don't forget to introduce yourselves and identify your agency. Masha, in the first row, please. Good afternoon. TAS Information Agency, Maria Stepanova, I have several questions to ask. The first is about the various options that you've reviewed over the Board of Directors' meetings. Did you consider raising the curate by two percentage points? Similarly, I have a question about mortgage sector, because yesterday the President stated that the family mortgage can be extended depending upon the way the central bank will look at it. We substantively considered two options to keep the uh, right and uh, raising it by 100 basis points. There were certain individual suggestions to raise it by 200 basis points, but we uh, materially considered two 
options. With regard to the family mortgage, we believe that the family mortgage is an example of a very specific mortgage funding, because we overall believe that if it's not specific, if it's not individualized, which previously had been launched as an anti-crisis measure, must be uh, finished in July, but in terms of the family mortgage, that is something that deserves the discussion, and that is going to be the prerogative of the government. Nastya, in the second row, please. Thank you. Anastasia Savilova, Interfax Agency. Can one consider that the cycle of uh, the key, ra key rate growing is close to uh, the end or has already ended? Another question. You are noting that the credit activity is uh, decelerating in a number of industries, but at the same time, you underscore that the credit growth remains high. Don't you plan to make any additional macroprudential measures and decisions while uh, we are not still talking about raising? Using the cyclical uh, markup as such. Well, if you uh, consider our base uh, scenario, yes, indeed, we are close to the growing uh, key rate uh, coming to an end, but it will strongly depend upon the situation uh, with the um, stable inflation components and our specific decision about the key rate we're going to make uh, based upon the new uh, data and making our forecast more specific. Our next call, Board of Directing Meetings, as I, I shall remind you, is when we're going to update our forecast. Now, as far as the slowdown in the lending is concerned, we believe that the raising of the key rates uh, uh, the instances that have already taken place, they did impact dynamics in terms of the deposits because we saw that the response was much quicker in terms of lending as well. But in the meantime, these are just indicators and in the retail lending and in mortgage because of uh, some broad subsidized uh, mortgage program, the mortgage uh, per se is not decelerating. As far as macroprudential tools are concerned, we are applying them in order to curtail the uh, um, borrowers with risks that are trying to be more active so as to avoid risks to the financial stability. But in terms of the volumes of lending, this is what we are controlling with our key rate. And so macroprudential measures are in no way setting off or substituting the key rate because they have a totally different specific function. But when we apply these measures, we understand that by impacting the risk-related part of lending, that overall may affect the general lending trends, and we take that into account when we decide on the key rate. Thank you. Next question from Bloody Kafkas, Alik Puhayev, Ossetia Telegram Channel, please. Yes. Greetings to the leadership of the Central Bank. I have a question. The uh, head of the Central Bank, uh, of the uh, Sber Bank, uh, Herren Graf, said that there is a 35 percent difference between the rates that the markets are offering in Moscow and in the regions. And so if the mass subsidized mortgage program is coming to an end, then that gap will go down to 5 to 7 percent. Does the Central Bank believe that the current indicators demonstrate that there is a mortgage bubble in the real estate market? which, if it bursts, would generate a lot of negative effects. Yes, we do believe that there is an overheating in the mortgage market. And one of the indicators about that is what you are describing, the difference in prices in between the first and the secondary market based on what we see. This difference, this gap, is currently at 42 percent. There are some regions where it is even bigger, and there are some where it is not as big. Before introducing broad mortgage programs, that difference was not 5, 7, but 10 percent, understanding that there's a difference in just freshly built housing and the secondary market housing. So that difference was 10 percent. And so this additional 30 percent in many ways is the consequence of the subsidized programs becoming en masse. But the price dynamics also points to the overheating, I mean, specifically in the housing market, because uh, the demand um, growing, 
uh, in this sector uh, in many ways transformed itself into price growth. And we certainly believe that there must be some cooling down. The rate of growth of the mortgage uh, programs must be um, uh, balanced. And so this difference between the first and the secondary housing market is going to dwindle. This gap creates the risks for the households in the first place uh, who may end up being in uh, not to being able to service uh, the uh, loans while in the secondary market, uh, in, on average, uh, prices are 40 percent lower. And so to avoid this outcome, it is necessary for the overall demand for housing to grow at a balanced pace uh, and uh, for there not to be such a gap. Uh, next, uh, Dmitry, in the second row, please. Dmitry Petrinka, Commerzant. Certainly, uh, lengthy growth, growth above the potential will bring about uh, many negative effects. One of them is non-optimal investment, because we are having a very active investment process. Have you ever assessed uh, in the midterm outlook uh, whether this is a significant factor or not? To what extent um, our growth potential is uh, low? because uh, not all of the investments that are being done right now should have been done. And are there any other uh, side effects um, in such a lengthy overheating? Long-term overheating, one of the main effects is the one that we're referring to, inflation becoming higher, which in itself and its deviation from the target, which generate negative uh, outcomes for investment because long-term uh, loans uh, are becoming less in number, and uh, the long money, as uh, they're called, uh, in the first place are based upon the low predictable inflation. So in terms of the sources of funding, inflation growing is a negative uh, factor, and this deviation from the potential. And with regards uh, to non-optimal investments, it is indeed a very important issue because the question of the future development is not uh, in the amount of investments being done right now, but them being effective, which promote the labor productivity and uh, something that can be recouped investors. And uh, of course, um, with such a positive uh, gap in an issue and uh, with inflation, uh, the indicators of such investment projects can become distorted. This is a very material issue, so it is very important to go back to a balanced growth. But in terms of different weight distributions and shares of ineffective investments is something that is difficult to do. But at a qualitative level, this is indeed a very significant challenge. I believe that uh, while this country's economy is passing through the structural transformation, the quality of investments is crucial. Uh, Mr. Zabotkin, yes, I would like to add a couple of words about different kind of consequences, because if investments are not well thought out and in the end will generate a lesser return uh, against what is currently being planned that may bring about greater risks to the financial stability simply because potentially those are going to be bad debts. So the only recipe is to go back to the trajectory of a balanced growth without allowing economy to remain in a strong gap like that for a long period of time. Thank you very much. Uh, Sergei, in the second row, please. Arguments and facts. Uh, could you please tell us why, against such high rates, people continue to take loans? What are the kind of fears that feed the inflation expectations amongst the households? My second question is, can the high key rate bring about a recession in 2024 in whether a central bank will reduce the rate if it sees such a threat? We don't expect recessions next year, you know, our forecast, although we're going to update it further in February, anticipates growth uh, from half percent to 1.5 percent, so it is important to make timely decisions. with regards to cooling excessive demand and bringing the inflation down, because the countries which are late in doing so in order to return the economy to a balanced growth and to bring down inflation, they have to pass through recession. And our policy is aimed specifically to do it in a very timely manner and avoid recessionary risks. As far as your first question is concerned, 
as to why households, even against high rates, continue to take credits. One should say, although, we do see that the consumer lending unsecured one is starting to slow down. I mean, households start responding to high rates. But overall, people are fearing inflation. People are fearful of their savings losing value and against all other things being equally, even against the same kind of rates when the expectations, inflation expectations are high and growing in the minds of the people, they make real rates more acceptable because what is a real rate? This is a market rate minus the kind of inflation that they are expecting to unfold. And if the inflationary expectations are high, so in their minds, the real rates don't look to be that high. And that is why the central bank must raise the rate in response to the inflation expectations and the growing inflation. Like I said, the unsecured consumer lending is already demonstrating its response in terms of the dynamics to the uh, growing rates. And the market mortgage uh, offerings where people take uh, loans based on the market rates, there is a very significant slowdown of such loans being taken, um, I would say, down to 30 percent. And so the subsidized mortgage where the rate is fixed, it's becoming more and more attractive because the higher is their expect inflation expectations, the higher are the market-based rates, then this all makes the subsidized mortgage more attractive because inflation expectations currently are at the level of 12 percent. So people do think that the inflation will be at 12 percent, while the mortgage, subsidized mortgage rate is 8 percent. So of course this is super attractive. And the availability of subsidized uh, programs does require um, uh, us to take this into account in our decisions to raise the right. Um, next, Marina, in the third row, please. Good afternoon, uh, Marina Pimnova, NTV News. Uh, over the past several months, you were saying that the labor is short and this is a critical problem. Does the central bank see any way out of it? And does the central bank have such a problem with a shortage of stuff? And my second question, in your press release, the central bank is uh, talking about the individual uh, product prices growing. I believe that everybody knows uh, about the product that everybody is talking about. I mean, uh, the prices are growing today. Uh, have the board of directors ever mentioned the word eggs, chicken eggs. Well, as far as the shortage of uh, personnel is concerned, yes, we do experience a certain shortage of highly skilled people, um, IT personnel in the first place, because not only um, the whole of the financial market is switching to the digital, the central bank is trying to become more and more digital, which is driven by a large um, number and development of uh, programs. We do experience such shortage, like for example, in the information security. This is a general thing in the market. Now, how one can deal with this problem? Well, certainly, this is a bit of a limitation uh, in terms of the ability to additionally expand one's operation. So our policy does impact the demand in order for the demand to remain a balanced one so that it uh, wouldn't uh, re just going down the drain. I mean, all of our efforts. But overall, of course, uh, improving labor productivity and the processes of automation and investments, because it is important for them to remain effective and to lead to the labor productivity growth, this uh, certainly would soften the problem. But we must take into account that the investments are being done right now, while the effect is what we're going to see sometime later, while the demand is becoming stronger currently. And so overall, that requires a balanced approach. And so we do see, like in many regions, the problem of uh, the labor shortages uh, uh, is being worked uh, on. Uh, people are looking for uh, additional labor, or which is described as participating in the labor um, uh, uh, transformation, adding uh, sh additional shifts uh, without additional investments to improve the labor processes. That is also the hidden reserve. So businesses are still trying to find ways and means uh, how to deal with that problem. But we do see these in the uh, wage dynamics and the whole issue of uh, shortage of labor is one of the factors which uh, restricts the capacity to expand operations, even if the businesses are uh, willing to do this. Uh, and about the eggs, sorry, yes. Although 
the general pace of price growth is uh, important to us because we talk about the general price growth. We are uh, monitoring the basic inflation characterized by the stable component. We definitely not take our attention away from prices growing within a certain product segments in food as well as travel, where prices may become volatile in terms of the um, uh, um, um, airfare. We are looking at the price uh, structure. Uh, trying to see whether this is one one-off factor or the consequence of the overall inflationary pressure, we do make such analysis naturally. Uh, colleagues, the next question comes online. Denis Elachowski. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. I wanted to extend on the topic of the observed and expected inflation over the past nine years that the Bank of Russia was targeting inflation at the level of 4 percent per annum. The observed inflation never went below 8 some percent, even during the period since 2017 to 20 when the official inflation was around the official level. Uh, the observed inflation was uh, much higher. So my three short questions. What do you think is the reason as to why the observed inflation is so chronically high? Do believe your 4% target that people, as, uh, other people, I mean, uh, um, uh, apart from the uh, Russian Office of Statistics, uh, never s s noted. And doesn't Central Bank has any intention or any plans to uh, share uh, the proper methodology with the Russian Office of Statistics? Well, indeed, there is a gap between official inflation figures and the way households hmm, see it. I mean, the observed inflation. But apart from the observed inflation, we also note the expected inflation as indicator, what value it will present in 12 months' time. And practically in all countries, there is always a gap between the observed and the official inflation levels. I believe that the gap in as far as the country is concerned, which have been targeting inflation for long, is a little bit less. In our case, it's a little bit more. And so this gap grows when inflation accelerates. But alongside with that, the trends are almost the same. I mean, the observed inflation and the official inflation figures, because if one grows, the other does as well, and the other way around. It is not always the case with the expected inflation. Uh, the inflation, both the official and the observed one, may grow, but the households may expect inflation to subside. I mean, because decisions are being made about the monetary policy and they generate certain temporary factors which impact inflation, like the exchange rate weakening and then again appreciating. So that happens. But of course, to us, it is very important for inflation expectations to be closer to our inflation target. And that is what we describe as, um, as um, uh, anchoring inflation expectations. Because if the inflation expectations are anchored, then principally speaking, uh, if the inflation deviates from the target uh, like the case is currently, then there may be a need for uh, more refrained decisions about the key rate as opposed to when the expectations are high because we've just spoken about the way the high inflation expectations impact people's minds in uh, the uh, consumer lending market. As far as the uh, Russian Office of Statistics methodology is concerned, it usually takes into account the picture related to the current spending. Every now and then it changes it. So if it continues to do it like that, we would be eager to participate in this process. Mr. Zabotkin will be willing to add something. Something? Um, yes, I mean, the methodology by the Russian Office of Statistics, because specification of the central bank basket is taking place uh, regularly. So once the January inflation data is available, then the Russian Office of Statistics will present uh, its uh, understanding of how it's going to do that next year. And these updates are being done following the observed structure of consumption. And so the basket ends up uh, big, having put into it the kind of items which uh, form the core consumption. So this methodology is very close, uh, and it uh, repeats uh, uh, best international practices. Again, the reasons uh, behind the uh, differences that you may see in the Russian Office of Statistics and what the households expect, uh, are uh, uh, they come from the way people think about the price growth, because in many ways that is because, uh, to a large extent, more attention is being paid to the goods uh, for which price 
prices change much stronger. And in a high inflation, uh, there is a, a longer list of such products. And so statistically measured inflation consequently grows. So it is important for the observed inflation to uh, come to closer to the statistically measured one. Colleagues, your questions. Margarita, in the second row, please. Margarita Mordovina, RBK. Uh, my question is going to be about inflation. You mentioned in your statement that uh, it uh, um, uh, goes along the upper threshold, but the analyst uh, and the president of the country have a more pessimistic uh, look towards it. They expect it to be close to 8 if not percent, if not more. Now, is there a possibility that the central bank before the end of the year will review its inflation forecast uh, for 2023? What it will depend upon, and is it is possible for your inflation forecast to be reconsidered for 2024 before you go into your core board meeting. Our forecast currently is that inflation in 2024 will stay close to the upper threshold of our October forecast, which is 7.5%, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on the way the price picture evolves over the last few weeks because as you can as you have been able to see the weekly inflation is quite volatile. I mean as far as analysts are concerned their forecasts are not strongly different from ours. Seven point six. Yeah, seven point six. I mean our surveying of analysts shows seven point six. So for twenty twenty four we are not changing our forecast. We believe that by twenty twenty four um, with us pursuing respective monetary policy towards the end of the year, we may have four and four and a half percent inflation. But of course, the risks are shifting towards pro-inflationary ones. I mean, the risk of inflation deviating from this forecast upwards is much stronger than downwards. Thank you very much, colleagues. The next question comes online from Evgenia Pismanova Bloomberg. Genia, please. Uh, good afternoon. Yuan has become the basic currency of international reserves for Russia since the start of 2022. And Yuan, or RMB, has lost 7% against US dollar since that uh, time. And the uh, Yuan rates are considerably lower. They are different ones. Do you see the risks of uh, Yuan reserves remaining in their value? Do you allow uh, diversifying in favor of other currencies? Uh, for example, are you considering the possibilities of accepting the Middle Eastern currencies into your reserve uh, toolkit? And my other question, since this is the last uh, meeting this year, we congratulate you on the forthcoming New Year and wish you to reach the 4% inflation. Thank you very much for this uh, wish-making. It's indeed a very good one. Thank you. Now, as far as Yuan is concerned, you know, um, currency fluctuations and the interest rates changes, um, that is what you see with regard to many reserve currencies. Uh, for example, uh, when uh, we had uh, a certain share of US dollars and euros, uh, uh, we also went through revaluations and uh, a certain losses um, uh, could have uh, ensued. But our investments are not short term. This is, this is indeed a safety cushion to be able to respond to different risk scenarios. We do not see any risks of uh, currencies remaining intact. Again, short-term fluctuations are possible. And besides, despite it all, our gold and currency reserves remain diversified to a lesser extent. We've got quite a considerable share of gold, and the gold has actually risen in its value. And we are cognizant of that. Now, as far as the diversification of the gold currency reserves is concerned, we are not really looking into that as an option because it seems to us that the existing structure of the gold and currency reserves enables us to cope with the issues for which these reserves are being established uh, and uh, in the first place to be able to uh, eliminate the risks to the financial stability because for example intervention in new ones if there is a need for it is quite feasible because the economy currently has reorganized itself and uh, there's a demand coming from
I mean, not as it used to be for only for US dollars and euros, but as well as for yuan as the foreign currency. That is why the kind of transactions that the gold currency does are intended for is what we can transact in this currency as well. Uh, thank you very much, Natalia. In the last row. Natalia Trushin, uh, the Moscow Comstomolis newspaper. My, also, uh, my question is also about inflation. Uh, what's interesting is that you've just uh, told us that by next year we expect inflation to be a little bit above 4%. Now, what are the prerequisites that regulator sees uh, in order for this to go down? Is it going to be a big crop, or the battle of oil is going to be at $100, or the uh, mass production of chicken meat uh, will uh, be launched? Why are the price is going to go down? What do do you foresee that the prices are going to slump? Uh, Why all of a sudden, uh, from 7.5 towards the end of the year, in 2024, it will go down to 4%. The 4% inflation means that the price growth pace is going to be not as high as this year. On average, uh, I mean, when we talk about the consumer price index, on average it's going to be 4.5 percent. Of course, there could be a certain one-off factors that you are referring to, but at the same time, we believe that a stable inflation, it is going to be 4 and 4.5 percent, not dependent upon these one-off factors, and that will happen specifically because the demand will be in line with the supply capacity. And that is what our monetary policy is aimed on. And when we raise our Q rate with a certain time lag that uh, transforms itself into the credit and deposit rates, that also affects whether people want to save or spend, and that uh, impacts the demand and the prices eventually. So this is the mechanism that we've used on more than one occasion when, for example, you may recall 2015 when we uh, reduced our inflation from 15 percent to 7 percent, so this mechanism is effective, and we apply it in our monetary policy. Thank you. Next question online from Tula comes from Yulia Alexandrova, uh, my slow internet publishing. This is the question about the inflation expectations. You are uh, paying a lot of attention to the household's inflation expectations, and as I understand, the central bank, by raising the key rate, wants to reduce its expectations. But simple households nevertheless view this uh, as the signal to act. If the rate is being brought up, then prices will continue to grow higher and faster. That means that that you need to go and take a loan until the rate is uh, the same. So you need to buy electronics and cars right now, unless it all becomes more expensive, until the exchange rate with the dollar is not higher again. So how are you going to deal with these contradictions, and what are you going to advise the households on what they should do in the right way? Well, we've just had a discussion about this topic, i.e., when people expect the rates to go up, and they have high inflationary expectations. They may have this propensity to go and take a loan from a bank quicker. And if inflation is going faster, and the key rate is not catching up, fast as well. This inflation expectations is going to accelerate and people will take more and more loans. So that is why we're undertaking very resolute measures. We're raising the key rate uh, uh, quite uh, materially because this uh, path in between uh, the uh, 7 and 16 percent we've covered within half a year in order to extinguish this inflation expectations, which means that the deposits are going to be more attractive, and that is actually something that we already observe. And the um, trend for the households to put more into the deposits is there. Uh, so cash is flowing back to the banks. With a bit of a lag, we do see that the credit channel also uh, follows suit. So there is a very tangible response to that, and we believe that that will bring the inflation expectation down. But the uh, first line of uh, effects uh, is what you observe every time when the uh, key rate uh, rising cycle begins. We know it, uh, we take into account, and that is why we believe that our response should always be timely. Grigory, in the second row, please. Uh, Grigory Bajenov, uh, Popular Economics. 
Um, I also wanted to ask a question about the inflationary expectation, the inflation above the target, that is only about the target, is something that we've uh, uh, seen over the past three years. Definitely, we do observe in an anchoring of the anchor uh, that uh, uh, you've tried to put in uh, until now. And so my question is this. Uh, as of now, uh, there is an impression that the inflationary expectations are more and more adaptive uh, in their nature. Uh, so how long uh, the central bank believes it will be necessary uh, in terms of how much time will be required to put the new anchor into the inflationary expectations? So this is the first part of my question. The second part of my question, uh, is there not a need to uh, review the tar inflation target and to make it more realistic, and specifically the anchor when I believe over the next few years we might we, we, we might end up having a higher level of government spending and the fiscal expansion and the shortage of labor um, related to the conditions that we find ourselves in. Um, isn't not going to be more realistic, I mean, to expect this, is, is this ex expectations. Well, with regard to, indeed, uh, uh, the inflationary expectations remaining high uh, for several years, this is still something that we are concerned uh, with uh, strongly, because I believe that the anchor of the low uh, predictable inflation must be the most important anchor. Uh, sometimes we are being told that the exchange rate uh, should be the one. Um, I'm not going to explain right now as to why it doesn't mean that we need to invent a new anchor. We simply need to reduce uh, uh, the inflation. Inflation expectations have always been adaptive. They have always followed in the wake of the inflation. And really, uh, over the short period, I mean, relatively short period of time that we had since we started targeting inflation and then up to 2021, uh, I mean, uh, in terms of the serious anchoring of the inflationary expectations, but they were more anchored uh, compared to the targeting of inflation, I can uh, bet you. Uh, and so it is so important to bring inflation back to the in and the inflationary expectations, well, I mean, to what it should be. As far as the target being realistic or not is concerned, I mean, the target or rather, achieving the target will bear a positive consequence, amongst other things, broadening the planning time frame, investing, investing long-term decisions, because when people are going to be sure that the inflation is going to remain under control for a long period of time, only then the long-term investments and long-term loans are going to be made available. But this all can be easily undermined by changing the target uh, uh, in line with the circumstances. Changing the target is the worst approach to ensuring long-term investments. When we were doing our review of the monetary policy in 2021, we thought that we already had the prerequisites to reduce the target, because when reducing the target, the level of uh, uh, public welfare grows in many senses. But this should be done only after we stabilize inflation around 4 percent. But the next move should be towards reducing the target, not to uh, increasing it. Alexey Borisovich, will you say something as well? Well, the only the point is something that we've already heard many times. If we change our inflation target based on the changing circumstances, that would be similar to there being no target at all. Uh, this is almost like playing a football game or a soccer game and moving the uh, goal line. because. The ability to achieve price stability against all odds, that is what we're after. Um, of course, the time frame can change a little bit in terms of us uh, uh, achieving the uh, um, end, because like you said, that uh, it will be in the end of 2024, not in 2023, uh, because uh, serious shocks occurred uh, due to unprecedented external changes. But to always move uh, your target uh, uh, rightward, no. So we're targeting 4.5% 4 towards the end of 2024. And, and uh, we're not going to give us uh, ourselves um, any uh, easement. Uh, the next question comes from the CGTN Russian service. Mitri Maslow, please. Elvira Sakhvizadovna, good afternoon. 
Chinese media corporation, Russian service, Mitya Maslak, Moscow correspondent. Could you please tell us the financial year is almost over. What are the landmarks that the central bank keeps for 2024? Do you keep the de-dollarization pace, um, then your digital ruble uh, development and uh, growing the mutual uh, settlements uh, with Middle Eastern countries and China in their national currencies? Well, our landmarks for 2024, I mean, we've got many things that we are working on. So I believe that one can give you the response in a nutshell. The basic target is to bring inflation to target, to our target close to 4%. Undoubtedly, to continue to support financial stability. It is very important to maintain financial stability. And certainly, all of the programs related to economic development, you mentioned the digital ruble. This is one of a series of important projects because we're currently doing a pilot quite successfully in the meantime. And as of 2024, we intend to expand it. We already have a queue lined up of uh, entities willing to participate in it. And uh, settlement in national currencies that you mentioned is also an important uh, piece uh, last year. And this year, we worked hard over making it possible for our businesses against the existing restrictions to transact in their foreign economic activities in different national currencies. And first of all, to switch to making settlements in national currencies of the counterparties. We do observe that uh, the volume of such settlements and transactions have grown, both in exports and imports. The share of toxic currencies has shrunk. Um, if we look at the beginning of this year, the share of toxic currencies uh, accounted for uh, just uh, half. Right now, it's less than a quarter. In exports and imports, the trends are the same. And actually, the share of RMB is, is growing. Very active settlements are being done in this currency. So, of course, the settlement system, the international transaction, is something that we're going to develop further and support in many ways. Dear colleagues, Delia, in the row before the last one. Thank you very much, Dilara Sonsova, Aliena Novosti. Elisa Sahibzarovna, the first question that I have is an international one. The European Commission already announced the possibility of passing long, longer term the income from the frozen um, Russian assets to Ukraine. And does the central bank plan to undertake any measures uh, to uh, use the uh, uh, income from the frozen Western assets in Russia? And when the uh, uh, litigation is going to be started um, uh, to try and return the Russian assets? Uh, my second question is um, um, a bit personal. Um, uh, you know, it's coming to the year is coming to an end. Congratulations of, uh, within next year. Uh, some Russians are getting bonus payments uh, and uh, other. Uh, incentives, but what do you advise the Russian citizens to do? Should they spend this money or just save them or invest into the housing? Housing doesn't seem to be very um, lucrative right now. Well, as far as <clears throat> sequestering the income from the frozen assets, simply because that might undermine the perspective prospects of the euro being used as the reserve currency, but generally in terms of any possible litigation with respect to the frozen assets, I mentioned it more than once, we are preparing ourselves. There are certain difficulties, but we are working on this issue. As far as the bonuses and benefits and incentives uh, are concerned and how one should better dispose of it, well, quite clearly, in the Christmas days, many are buying gifts to their family and uh, uh, kin and friends, uh, well, that's normal to try and make a pleasant surprise like that. But we avoid giving any specific advice. But I would simply like to draw one's attention that the deposit rates are uh, sufficiently attractive. They are in a positive zone. Thank you. The next question online from Tver from Elena Potechina, Caravan newspaper. 
Good afternoon. My question has already been mentioned partially, but nevertheless, the Bank of Russia over this year has multiple times raised its key rate, but the prices continue to grow nevertheless, and many believe that the high key rate doesn't work. Could you tell us why is it happening that way? And what is the effect in making the key rate higher? And most importantly, how does that reflect upon the lives of the households? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Well, I would like to tell you that the rate is effective. It is working already. If we were not to raise it, the inflation could have been much higher, while the ruble exchange rate much weaker. But the basic effect from the key rate being risen several times, uh, what we've done this year, we see in the following. Because the rate, and this is not only this time, that has always been the case, it doesn't demonstrate its effect right away, in due time. And there is a certain uh, sequence of events, because first we impact the uh, deposit rates that the banks offer. Through that, that influences the lending pays, savings, and through that to the demand. And that is then translated into prices. So this sequence is quite lengthy. The full effect from making a key rate decision demonstrates itself in about three to six quarters. It doesn't mean that in the first two quarters nothing works. It does. But the biggest effect is um, uh, happening um, in, in, within the period in between the third and sixth quarter. But what the households uh, may uh, enjoy from it, inflation slowing down and the savings and the purchasing power of their income and accumulated savings um, saving them from devaluation. Thank you. Artyom, please, in the third row. Thank you. Elvira Sakrizano. No, good afternoon. Terentiev Artyom Forbes. Uh, the government is currently discussing reducing twice the maximum uh, size of the subsidized mortgage loan uh, for the regions and the first contribution lowering down to 30%. Dutch and Robin believe that this might uh, sufficiently slow the subsidized mortgage. And why? Second question, the uh, side effects. Um, uh, can it happen? I mean, when the uh, first contribution to the mortgage loan could uh, also involve the people going to take consumer loans and using it for the mortgage loan arrangement. We support the government measures currently undertaken to specify subsidized mortgage scheme more, which will cool down the market a little bit. But the main effect uh, is that the overall mortgage portfolio will definitely positively affect the key rate situation, uh, but it is also um, our macroprudential measures, which, by the way, from the 1st of January, are going to be additionally made tougher, and that is something that has already been announced. Now, the side effects that you refer to, that may happen when people who fall short of money to make an original contribution, because there is a requirement. If the requirements of the original contribution are being raised, they will go for the consumer loans. We monitor this. We take a look at when the people take the mortgage loans, whether within the previous 100 days they took any uh, consumer loan and so I think the share of such individuals last year was 3.8 percent today it is 6.4 percent I mean this indicator has grown but it is not yet too big so this is what we're going to monitor and as part of our uh, supervisory work we're going to uh, do this specific uh, activity with the banks in order for, to, for them to adequately assess the risks and the original sources of funding. The next question comes online from Andrei Morashov. The truth of the north from Archangel, as is known, the Western capital market are now closed um, for the uh, domestic companies, but also it was uh, heard that the banks expect the profit will amount to three trillion rubles. That is an impressive figure. And so my question, does the central bank have mechanisms available to help channelize these funds into the development of the domestic economy? The bank's profit effectively is the source of capital, particularly when the external markets are closed. Then this is the main source for the banks to grow their capital. Why it is important to grow? the bank's capital, because it is specifically the banking capital growing makes it possible to develop lending, because we have certain requirements and standards for the banks to have respective level of capitalization. Um, and we do know that the lending is growing at a high pace, and lending is 
funding the economy, both on the consumer side of things, which is funding the demand um, by the households for the products manufactured in the Russian economy, because we hear here some excessive overheating. Uh, even uh, corporate lending is growing. Uh, over the 11 months, um, Russian businesses uh, received from the Russian banks uh, the loans worth 11 trillion rubles, which is funding of the economy. Uh, now, bearing in mind the fact that many banks are government-owned ones, I mean, they pay dividends, and, uh, all the banks are paying taxes and dividends, and so based on our estimate, over the past year, the banks may uh, make a uh, budget contribution at the level of uh, almost three trillion rubles, which may cover certain uh, public spending and the social spending and the economic support measures. Um, and even after the dividends uh, are paid, uh, the bank's profit, which may be put into the capital, could be quite considerable. We expect it to be about one trillion, one and a half trillion, which would make it possible for the banks to continue developing further their economic lending next year. And so we expect that the lending will grow in a more balanced uh, pace uh, at about 10 to 15 percent incrementally. Uh, 10 to 15 percent. Five, 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 yeah, sorry, 5 to 10 percent incrementally. <clears throat> now, as for as, um, um, putting resources into transformation projects, you know that we have adopted spe special regulation is just about starting to work, and we will take a look at the way the banks are um, diverting this uh, into various sectors. But you should also keep in mind that uh, the 2023 profit must not be considered different uh, from the 2022 because in that year the bank's profits uh, pl plummeted more than in any other industry. Ten times in non-financial sector, it was approximately the same, it remained at the same level, maybe maybe just slightly slightly uh, lower. So if you look uh, through the past two years, then the profit level uh, is even lower than during the calm 2021. And actually, it is uh, necessary also to keep in mind that the non-financial sector profit remains high, which makes it possible to invest, to uh, fund the development of uh, businesses um, at one's own expense. Uh, yes, please, Mr. Zapotkin. Well, maybe just um, uh, for you to understand the scale of uh, this, what we hear, uh, you know, three trillion rubles, which is the banking profits, uh, banking industry profit. Profits. This year, the average monthly profit of non-financial sector, more than three trillion, non-financial sector, every month earns more than the banking sector does throughout 12 months in a year. Uh, Natalia, in the second row, please. Uh, good afternoon, Natalia Zabutskaya, Viedomosti. How many resident, non-resident assets can be blocked on the C and E accounts? Uh, do you plan to offer to the Russian investors who have assets on special accounts certain ways of how to use them, for example, a buyout or some swap or an exchange? And another question, if I may, what are the additional measures that the central bank and the government, in compliance with the presidential tasks, have adopted or are going to, to support the uh, public offerings by the Russian companies. Is there any basic statistics expected uh, on that particular point uh, for the Russian issues next year? Well, as far as uh, uh, the um, um, uh, account C and E are concerned. Yes, there is a certain accumulation taking place. We never disclosed the amount of funds uh, held there. No. Enough. Now, as far as uh, what they can be applied to, the recent decree makes it possible to de-block the blocked assets, and this is the main thing that we consider. Also, the C accounts can be used to pay taxes, if I'm correct to remember it, uh, Philip. Uh, yeah, yes, oh, I see, I understand. Um, right, uh, so to swap the blocked assets is possible. Now, as far as um, uh, stimulating the public offerings and public placements, 
that is indeed a very important area. If you take a look at the main guidelines for the development of the financial market, you will find a whole set of measures in order to uh, create this uh, stimulus uh, and incentivize such uh, offerings. And there are uh, certain quantitative uh, um, prognostic uh, um, um, data. That is there. I can't recall it from my memory right now. Sorry. Uh, that was it, right? Right. <laughs> And colleagues, uh, Fyodor, in the last row, please. Fyodor Ivanov, Invest Future. Good afternoon. Uh, over the past few months, uh, the oil market has been quite volatile, so it would be great to find out about the extent of the past two years that the economy to which the Russian economy became more dependent upon oil and respectively the ruble exchange rate and inflation. And my second question about the current record low unemployment level. Does the central bank believe that uh, this uh, is the kind of level that one may definitely achieve the 4% inflation target level? If not, when w w then what? will be the, or should be the unemployment level in order to be able to achieve this inflation target. As far as uh, the dependence upon the oil, uh, one, should, one should really phrase it oil and gas sector is concerned. The share of the oil and gas sector in the Russian GDP has gone down, um, both due to the uh, oil production carts and gas production carts and also because of uh, the better economic growth in other industries. And so we're less dependent. But whenever we talk about the economic dependence, the fiscal dependence and the exchange rate dependence upon the commodity fluctuations and overall the demand and supply in oil and gas, of course, one of the tools which enables one to reduce this dependence is the fiscal rule, because the fiscal rule has enabled us to really uh, safeguard this country's economy and the exchange rate from um, excessive fluctuations. Now, the fiscal rule over the past two years has been functioning, but not in its final shape and form. That is why we believe that the gradual continuous fiscal normalization is uh, important and for the fiscal rule to remain there as far as unemployment. Um, is concerned and what kind of unemployment level there may be in order for the economy to grow and for the prices not to grow too fast, for the growth to be balanced. There is such a notion of a natural unemployment level, uh, which theoreticians often resort to, or the full employment, in order to demonstrate against which unemployment level the economy grows um, at a potential pace, uh, uh, let's say in a stable balanced uh, uh, pace and the inflation is at target. But this is not an observed indicator. We're not uh, making any calculus about it. But the current unemployment level definitely, um, one may definitely say, is below this level. And that is manifested by the inflation growth, because one of the indicators of the economy being overheated is inflation. Mr. Botkin, would you add something? Well, I believe I should remind one about how the unemployment is being calculated, because unemployment is the number of people who are actively searching for jobs divided by the number of uh, employed and those who are looking for uh, employment. And so, respectively, in a situation when you have a high demand for labor and the real wages grow quickly, something that uh, the governor already mentioned, in the economy, usually, he, the people are uh, becoming more involved in the labor force, and, and so those who are actively looking for employment are going to join that active uh, labor. I mean, those who previously didn't consider themselves to or didn't believe or were not interested in becoming part of the labor force. And so against these conditions, we definitely can observe a certain unemployment level rising, even despite the fact that the amount of employment is not going to shrink but to grow because uh, of uh, those who previously were economically active joining it. So that's the way these things are going to, take, uh, to happen. Uh, are there any more questions, please, Maria, in the last row? Maria Filushina, Bitcoin. So, 
We now understand that the investor confidence is very important, particularly after the situation with St. Petersburg and change and the, the silence around it. Does the central bank plan to develop any specific mechanism for compulsory interaction um, between the financial institutions and the media in order for the people to know about what the financial institutions intend to do before they do that? We don't have the authority to establish the rules by which the financial institutions should interact with media, but generally speaking, I agree with the way you say it. In order for the confidence to be there, there should be a dialogue. Even if there is a difficult issue, you have to maintain a dialogue, you have to have a debate, and I believe currently the exchange is disclosing the information. Uh, Philip uh, Georgievich, uh, could you please uh, speaking to the microphone. Yes, thank you very much. I believe that the question should be made more specific. What is it that we fall short of specifically? Because I know that there were certain questions towards the exchange in terms of the specific individual situations uh, uh, related to individual investors and the disclosure. Of course, here the exchange must uh, establish such a contact and disclose to specific investors the ownership and the custody level and disposing this, uh, disclosing this information to an unlimited number of entities is something Something that I believe is difficult because it undertakes certain activities right now in order to uh, take off the blockings from the assets. You must be uh, keep this in mind. But I do agree that the exchange must be more active in maintaining contacts with investors and with the media. I mean, uh, there would always somebody who would be uh, not really satisfied with everything, so it would call for individual consideration. But you know, interoperability and interaction with the exchanges is necessary. I mean, it is not necessary to establish any minimum requirements, but to uh, really um, um, promote uh, such a dialogue with investors is something that I agree should be done. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, Roman, in the first row, please. Roman Bart of Romark.ru, when the rate um, became 10 percent, many expected that, like during the previous crisis periods, it is not going to last for long. And so the banks were not in a rush to open long-term deposits. Now, is there any reason right now to consider that the market players no longer believe that the current rate is uh, long-term and high? I mean, they cease to expect that uh, it will start going down soon. And my second question is more of a philosophic one. <laughs> Your top five risks for the Russian economy and uh, the international, I mean, next year and uh, I mean, uh, over the next two to three years as a time frame. Thank you. As far as the expectations on the part of the market players uh, are concerned, you're quite right. When we raised the rate first time very considerably in August, the expectation was that uh, the events of 2015 and 2022 will repeat themselves when we started producing the rate very quickly. But we were trying to give a very detailed explanation, and we did it several times, that hardly likely this would be repeated this time, because during the previous period, we raised the rate because of the risks to the financial stability. When the risks dissipated, we reduced the rate. Currently, we have been raising the rates because of the inflation. But it seems to me that after that, our market players' expectations have adjusted their poise. And we don't see any big difference between our expectations. I mean, we don't see that the markets are expecting that the key rate will start going down very quickly. I mean, as far as the trajectory is concerned, there are questions about it, and it will definitely depend upon uh, many factors. As far the, as the risks are concerned, there are external risks, there are internal risks. Amongst the external one's sanctions, they're still there, that remains. Then the uh, global economic slowdown risk, um, which will impact uh, our economy, although it depends upon oil and gases, not as strong as it used to be, it is still there. Then the economic fragmentation risks, I guess that is as far as the external environment is concerned. Of course, there are also internal risks. Mm, such as um, 
Well, let's say the stable inflation is going to slow down slower, but we're going to undertake all the necessary measures. And I suppose the risks related to the speed of the economic structural transformation, because we're all willing for it to be there, and coming from a greater efficiency, um, um, like, uh, for example, in the area of investments, uh, improved labor productivity as well. And so I always uh, feel the uh, 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 willing to change these risks around and get rid of what is making them be. I mean, uh, the labor shortage risks is, uh, as well, something that we are talking about frequently. The economics must take this into account, and the economists must take this into account in their various decisions. I don't know whether I've been able to give you five like you've uh, requested. Colleagues, please. Vladimir, in the third row. Thank you, Vladimir Soldatkin, Reuters. Could you please tell us to what extent uh, the analysts' estimates are correct that the central bank shall continue to sell currency next year rather than buy foreign currency, I mean? And my other question is this. The central bank has always been coming out for um, fair and equal competition, but at the same time, some companies are uh, taking the advantage uh, from the fact that they can uh, decide uh, themselves on which information they should disclose. So what's your attitude towards it? Thank you very much. With respect to what is going to happen to our um, activities in the currency market, well, this is true that well, we've uh, described the way we're going to uh, maintain a mirror-like um, uh, position. Uh, a lot will depend upon the current oil price. If you consider the current oil price, then most probably we will be on the sell side of things. I mean, against all other things being equal, that will support the national currency. Now, as far as your second question is concerned, well, indeed, a number of companies do get individual permission to not disclose some information, and that is conditions by, conditioned by high sensitivity towards uh, sanctional risks, strategic nature of such information. <laughs> but the overall principal position here is what we are not changing, because the public capital market, as they say, this is the market of data and information. And the investor confidence that we've uh, previously referred to is impossible without a good quality disclosure by the uh, uh, securities issues, like in the case of IPO. So we believe that if, that if securities are in the ranking list, quite often this signals quality to investors. So whatever is in the rating lists, historically, higher level of requirements has been imposed upon such securities. And the companies will have to decide and choose which information to disclose and, in this case, whether they would like to remain their position in the respective rating list. If they do, then they must not uh, offer false signals to investors. And we're currently specifically working on such conceptual approach so as to relate the amount of information disclosed to the level of listing uh, at an exchange. And I'm sure that we will find a balanced approach here. Thank you. Colleagues, uh, the time of the conference is coming to an end. The very last question, please. Tatiana Voronova, Frog Media. Thank you very much. We have several questions, one for the bankers and several questions uh, to investors. So uh, more often we see under sanctions small banks uh, who had access to SWIFT systems. So what's your perspective um, um, towards such players after they fall under the restrictions? And do you have any expectations about the number of banks uh, reducing in the country uh, during the 
last press conference, you mentioned that the central bank and other financial authorities are going to try and promote to the exchange uh, uh, the transactions, the companies who change their foreign shareholders, uh, their foreign shareholders for Russians. But we read in the documents that it applies only to the um, um, public joint stock companies, which means that not everybody will have be able to gain access to the exchanges. And so the discounts that such uh, transactions were able to get was only uh, the big businesses. So why the financial authorities uh, are pursuing this kind of strategy? I've got another question about the St. Petersburg Exchange. We do see that the friendly infrastructure didn't uh, work uh, once uh, the platform uh, came to the exchange. Do I understand correctly that this is not a panacea? And if I may, the, the central bank in, in its financial risk overview also stated that uh, there is an overhang. I mean, there could be an overhang made up of securities which are going to be transferred from a foreign infrastructure into a Russian one, and there could be certain uh, limitations uh, imposed upon transacting with such securities. So could you tell us when such limitations may be introduced and what kind of such limitations they may be? So many questions. I will try and give you a brief answer. As far as the banks are concerned, all the Russian banks against which sanctions were imposed continue to operate. All right. They are adapting their business models to bring it to suit the new market environment. They demonstrate profitability, and there, there is no reason to anticipate that amongst the banks who are sanctions, there will be principally a different kind of outcome. I'm sure that they will adjust their business models and will continue to operate effectively. As far as um, um, The placement into the stock market, which are being acquired by the Russian investors, uh, substituting the exiting foreign investors, that does apply to the public joint companies in order to maintain the level of openness and publicity uh, for the companies when they move from one proprietary structure into another, not to suffer. For non-public joint stock companies, non-public joint stock companies, there are such uh, assets that are being purchased in such a way, which indeed requires longer period of time, certain changes introduced into the corporate government because to gain a status of a public entity, that means to conform to uh, certain requirements. And we are going to do more work in order to stimulate the companies. Uh, really, it shouldn't matter whether they uh, you know, come from the foreign to the Russian um, jurisdiction or, or any other restructuring kind of thing, in order for them to become public and enter the capital market. We've uh, spoken about it more than once. Now, as far as um, St. Petersburg's exchange, right. Uh, yes, indeed, after the exchange was included in the sanctions list, uh, um, it became impossible to conduct trading in foreign securities. And also, um, the trading was um, stopped uh, in securities which are being accounted for in friendly uh, depository houses. But that doesn't violate the legislation, I should say. Uh, yes, of course, friendly nations haven't introduced sanctions, but uh, the transactions uh, that are being done by their uh, depository institutions ceased to be uh, done because of the secondary sanctions risk, because of the need for additional compliance procedures to be undergone. So currently that is what they're doing. And after uh, they are completed, as far as I understand, the exchange will make an announcement um, about uh, uh, the process uh, which will uh, take place, and the investors will be informed about it. And what was the last one? Um, uh, the financial market uh, overview. Uh, I think I missed uh, making a note about it. Uh, oh, yes, the overhang. No, we don't have any problems with this overhang. Don't we? Philip? No. Is there any idea to introduce any limitations? No. No limitations uh, to uh, trade uh, or the quasi Russian securities which are being redomiciled into Russia are expected to be introduced. Dear colleagues, thank you so much uh, and congratulations, everybody, uh, on the forthcoming New Year. Happy New Year, everyone.